Hello everyone and welcome back to Chips Weekly by Diana. As we are coming to the end of the year, I wanted to do something a little different. A 2025 year in review. Because the 2025 was, just another, was not just another year in the industry, it was very intense, it was very ambitious and in many ways it was also the reality check. With big breakthroughs and massive investments. So, and today I want to step back and look what really mattered for semiconductors in 2025. I'm very happy to be joined by the Robert Queen, the semiconductor industry ambassador and someone who spent decades at the intersections of technology, market, and the global supply chain. So, Robert, hello. And for the listeners who don't know you, would you introduce yourself, please? How are you doing today? And it's great being on the show with you. I, uh, I am Robert Quinn, the Semiconductor Industry Ambassador. I write and talk on LinkedIn with about 12 million impressions a year on LinkedIn, talking about semiconductor industry. I uh, started in the semiconductor industry in 19, 1997 uh, at Applied Materials and worked my way through chamber test, final test, uh, field service engineering on PVD, CVD, ALD, RTP, EPI, and all the different processes that we use to make these chips today. And uh, found myself later on, it, my wife said I had to come home. So uh, <laughs> I took a senior engineering job at Samsung for a while and then uh, transitioned to some management roles in the semiconductor industry um, for some smaller companies. But uh, part of my job as an operations manager was to kind of read the news, see what's going on in the world, see how it applies to our, our business. And uh, I was listening to a guy named Gary Vee on YouTube, and Gary said, do something for others, ask for nothing in return, do it on a daily basis, see what comes of it. I was like, well, I'll take this challenge. So I, uh, I, I was part of my day was to read the news, see what's going on in the world, see how it applied to our business. I said, I'll just start writing about this on LinkedIn. Well, I started adding 100 followers a day. CEOs, executives of the largest companies in the world were calling me and emailing me saying, I love your content, thanks so much for doing this. And it, it just exploded. Um, today, I, I've got uh, 68,000 followers, um, reaching 12 million impressions a year on LinkedIn. And it's just amazing to me that I can reach out and have discussions with the highest level CEOs and executives, from presidents to royal family members to, uh, to, to governors and CEOs around the world. I'm able to have those first level connections and be able to talk to them. So I spend a lot of my time today talking about semiconductor industries, speaking at a lot of events. I've been traveling a lot lately and uh, just talking about this ecosystem. And, and there's so, it's so complex and there's so much going into the semiconductor in industry ecosystem and what it takes to do what we do uh, to make these chips that we carry in our phone every day. So that's, that's, that's me. So in I think you are the best one to discuss with you all the news that happened in 2025. I think, uh, you know, it was, was, it was crazy. There was a lot of, a lot of growth. Oh my gosh. We, we saw, you know, the explosion of NVIDIA and all these other big, com all these other companies. And, uh, I, you know, I'm spending a lot of time lately attending a lot of data center conferences and, uh, and, and, you know, there with NVIDIA and Google and Microsoft and New future. Just, the, the, just the growth is just endless. It really is. It, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't stop with the amount of growth the, the, there is no cap. I don't, I don't see the end of, of this, this thing where it goes and, and when we're going to, uh, where, where it, where it ends up, who knows, but, uh, there is so much growth potential and, and I, I, I'm really excited about 2026 about what's coming. So. Yeah, me too. Good. So before we start, I will quickly explain how the today's episode will work. So I have selected five categories uh, that define the semiconductor story of the year. Uh, so from the products and companies to the biggest fail of the year. So Robert and I will be choosing one peak uh, from the short list of the options. And then maybe shortly explain why did we choose exactly this, uh, this one. So uh, let's get started. And with the first one, the first one for me was uh, the chip of the year. So there was uh, four variants that I've sent you, the NVIDIA Blackwell, MD MI300, and Apple M4, and TSMC N2 Notes. So be my guest, start, I would start with you, Robert. What, what did you choose? Apple was a great chip. Um, I mean... There was there was so so many of them that did such a great job. Um, how to pick one between all of them? Uh, you know, obviously, I, uh, <laughs> obviously that's that's kind of a hard hard one to do. Um, but uh, but there was a a a great uh, a great list there. Um, the 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 
chip of the year. I mean, it, it, it's really hard to measure because you know <laughs> there are so many there are so many different uh, different variances and different things that go into these chips. Um, I, I didn't have the. I don't know if we can. We're going to be able to edit this, but we'll. we'll if we can. Uh, if the the list. Of, of you uh, can add your 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 own personal chip of the years that they was not on the list. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> so, so the the. I mean, it would it would have to be you know just what what uh, what Nvidia did uh, with you know with with their GPUs and their their chips mm. that are going into those GPUs. Um, the, the computational power of these chips is just absolutely incredible. Um, we, we've also seen a lot of other companies uh, with that that weren't necessarily on the list that were are doing amazing things too. Cerebus, yeah, uh, Cerebus is uh, doing wafer scale chips. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen one of these. Yeah, but uh, this is a, a wafer scale chip. 2.6 trillion transistors and 850,000 cores. Um, absolutely amazing technology, right? And and where are we going with with that technology? And where does wafer scale technology go to? Um, but uh, absolutely, I, I think uh, the the Nvidia. So the Nvidia, you 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 would pick if it would be the one, it would be the Nvidia one, right? It would be the Nvidia. Uh, the Nvidia okay. would, would have to be it. It would uh, um, their computational power, the 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 architecture the everything that's gone into designing these chips um it, it's it's really they the, what's on the back end of that is just absolutely magic it, it really is and, yeah. and what they do to design into uh to be able to you know what it takes to manufacture these chips you know we're doing them at, at, at three to five nanometers you know to put, yeah, that, yeah, in, yeah. To put in, yeah, that into yeah. perspective you know 15 atoms you're talking about 15 atoms wide is three nanometers and so you know the the, the scale of the technology of what we're you know we're stacking atoms to make these chips today um is absolutely amazing and what tsmc is doing on that side to manufacture yeah. these chips is amazing so i have picked uh, md mi 300 so i was amazed by the architecture itself. It's a memory-centric AI chip accelerator that uh, designed for the uh, real workloads at scale. I mean, of course, NVIDIA is great, but what I also liked about AMD is that they made this competition at the ecosystem, that it's yeah. not only NVIDIA alone. This is what also really matters. It is. Yeah, that... it, it, it was great. You know, it's good to see that competition, to see the company. Exactly, exactly. Uh, that was yeah. also a peak for me, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely, and, and you know Lisa Sue is just absolutely amazing. Uh, she is she she has scaled that company from you know from the very beginning into where it is today, and uh, I I I think we're going to see a lot more coming out of them. True, totally, totally agree. So if we're coming to the next one, I think we teasered a little bit already on the company of the year. So there was a list I made it. NVIDIA, TSMC, Samsung, and ISML. And of course, if something what was not on the list, but you think it is the company of the year, please share. Samsung is great. They're doing, they're scaling. They're doing an incredible job. Um, I just had a really interesting discussion with um, a CEO of a large uh, data center company. TSMC has just done incredible things. TSMC has just, you know, they were there scaling uh, uh, pushing the limits of, of technology when nobody else was. And, and you know, we would see these, uh, when I was in manufacturing, we would see the, the old technology coming down the manufacturing line, and then you would see this one machine that would come out that, that would be coming down the manufacturing line that just had every bell and whistle on it. And it was the, the investment that they made at the time was just amazing to see that they were investing that, that amount of money into that new technology, and they are where they are today because of that. And uh, TSMC is absolutely amazing. I think uh, they're, TSMC they're is the to, one. They're, they're going to be it. I would um, add on what you previously said. For me, it's Nvidia. Nvidia, it's become just not just became a platform company. It's so it's so big. It's so huge. It's not just a chip. It made the whole ecosystem behind, which is purely amazing. Yeah. So Nvidia would be a pick for me. Is the one. Absolutely. NVIDIA is uh, amazing and I love the, the new options that they're offering. And, uh, and, and as far as the whole, you can, you can buy the whole data sense, you know, sort all, everything ready to go. And uh, they're, they're, they are a big game, game changer to the industry and for this artificial intelligence and this, you know, being able to, uh, to run these data centers that they're building around the world. 
Yeah, purely amazing. Uh, good, so the next one would be uh, the tech trend breakthrough of the year. So uh, what I have listed is AI-driven chips, uh, 3D advanced packaging, queer adoption, or the chiplet standards. What so would you pick? For me, it was 3D, 3D advanced packaging. Uh, 3D advanced packaging is, you know, we've, we've scaled Moore's law to now we're, now we're making oh. chips at two nanometers, right? Going into one nanometer, um, Moore's law kind of hits a dead end, right? It kind of comes to an end, but now we don't, we, now we don't f double transistor density anymore. Now we scale to computational power. And so seeing the, you know, we're going to see the change from that, but how does that happen? How, uh, computational hap power happens through uh, 3D packaging, architecture, neuromorphic uh, computing, doing mm -hmm. different types of architecture, different types of packaging, uh, being able to offer that, uh, this new uh, technology, you know, at scale for being able to, you know, and, and absolutely 3D packaging is going to be a big part of that, uh, that play in the future. Yeah, and to build on that, so for me it was a chiplet, which is very close to, to 3D packaging, right? So they made yeah. and they moved from this promise to the production reality. This was a big breakthrough that it went productive in 2025. So, but I think it goes in the same direction. The packaging is a new Moore's law, right? We can't scale more the chips. Yeah. And now it's coming uh, to the packaging side, yeah. And, and, you know, we've also seen Intel come out and say that they're going to do chiplet, uh, chiplet as well, um, chiplet technology. So they're going to be kind of an, uh, you know, TSMC is great because TSMC, but TSMC is also kind of a closed, closed room. Uh, they, you, you're going to do your packaging, you're going to do your design, you're going to do it within their architecture, within their, their house, um, their, their house of, and, and it's modular, right? And so I, Intel has now come out and said, we're going to do chiplet, BYOB, bring your own chips and, and, and we'll, you know, we will, we will scale and we can, we can architecturally, we can put these things together and, and design with you, with your, your, your chips that you want to use. So chiplet technology is going to be great. It's going to be uh, cost efficient and, yes. and it's going to, right. it's, mm -hmm. I really believe it's going to be a great, great way to scale IOT. Good, so the next one, the big acquisition or the deal of the year. So I have listed Synopsis and uh, Ansys, the Renaissance and Altinum and MD and Mypsology. So what would be for you? Given that I just had lunch with the vice president of Re Renaissance, I, I have to go to Renaissance. They're doing amazing things. Uh, the Japanese government has just uh, like um, put together a package for um, uh, of yearly funding. Uh, you know, we saw chips, uh, the chips act come out through the United States. We saw the chips act come through, you know, the EU and, and the, this money that was being funded. Now Japan is saying, Hey, we're going to just put it into our budget as a yearly thing. And, uh, Renaissance is a big part of that, of, of receiving that money. And, uh, I think Renaissance is going to do amazing things and I'm really excited for what they've got coming out in the future. Yeah, for me, it would be the synopsis acquiring the ANSYS. So it, was, uh, it wasn't just about the scale, but this control of the design flow mm -hmm. and combining EDA tools with advanced simulation. So I found it very fascinating and interesting how they also build this ecosystem uh, by combining mm -hmm. the whole EDA tools behind. Yeah. Uh, good. And the last one, what was uh, the biggest fail or uh, the reality check of the year? So the CHIPS Act execution, the Intel roadmap delay, or the quantum reality check? CHIPS Act was very, very powerful for the United States. So it was, it was, CHIPS Act was very important for the U.S., but um, at the same time, it kind of was a failure. I, I, you know, one of the things that, that there's a few things that they didn't support. They didn't support 200 millimeter. Uh, which is really disappointing to me because that's where R and D lives, uh, research and development lives in 200 millimeter, and uh, and they didn't allow the the uh, companies to purchase um, used equipment, which is you know it, it, that only leaves the game to the big players, and so allowing companies to have funding access to tools uh, that you know that could be 200 millimeter that could be used equipment. Um, being able to use those types of funds for that type of thing, it's disappointing seeing that. Um, and, and I'm, 
I am looking forward to a Chips 2.0, and uh, yeah. when I would like to really, I just did a post on it, that uh, I would really like to see a roadmap. And, you know, a, a lot of these countries, Europe, uh, as Europe is, uh, Japan is, South Korea is, they've got a 20-year roadmap. They, they've got these plans for long-term, not just, you know, we're not talking about just a, 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 the outlook of, of a stock market and seeing what, what that's doing. They're looking 20 years out. They're looking generations out. And how are we going to support this? And so I think that that's going to be interesting to see what the United States does in the future with CHIPS 2.0. So for me, it was uh, the Intel roadmap delay. So that also reminded that the execution still always beats uh, the ambition. Thank you very much. I think we are through through all our categories. What would you wish for the semiconductor world for 2026? You know, I've, I was just, uh, I did a post today. We've got uh, uh, GPUs going into space, Q1 2026. Uh, we've got uh, atomic layer deposition, thin film processing being done in, done in space Q1 2026. Um, I'm excited to see what e Elon and uh, NVIDIA do with uh, talking about launching GPUs into space and having data centers in space. That'll be interesting and see if there's any growth potential there. We're, we're, we're going to continue to see the 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 evolution the the demand for data centers it's not going to stop this is pandora's box we've opened <laughs> and we're going to need more data centers and so what does that mean that means we need more chips and it's this constant supply you know the and as we as artificial intelligence gets more demand we're going to see more demand of chips and so um there's going to be a lot of growth there um the need for electricity and uh, I, I believe I was re recently at Texas A&M where they're doing a SMR, a small nuclear reactor. Um, and they're going to uh, try to fast track this nuclear, uh, nuclear power, the, these small nuclear reactors that, so that we can use them. The biggest bottleneck of, this, of the data center world right now is transmission lines. We can't get the transmission lines to the data centers. And so um, fast tracking you know, things like small nuclear reactors will be interesting uh, to watch. And uh, and to see if that we can if we can build this ecosystem in the supply chain to make sure that everything flows because you know it, it's so interconnected between the data centers, the chips, the, uh, the the artificial intelligence, and this technological revolution that's coming to us right now. Uh, we have to be able to uh, support that with the whole infrastructure. Uh, yeah, I totally agree. Support. It's exciting year ahead, right? With all the innovations coming and application and AI data centers, as you mentioned, everything. Yeah? Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Yeah, thank you so much. And you have a, have a great holiday. You too.